year 407, the Emperor Constantine III led the last few Roman troops from these islands. The empire that had constructed this remarkable wall had crumbled in Britain. Now history books tell us that when the Romans pulled out, they took with them all vestiges of civilization and effectively turned out the lights. The country then plunged into centuries of cultural and economic chaos, known as the Dark Ages. Now all of this would be fine were it not complete rubbish. As an archaeologist, I've spent my career exploring Britain's ancient past, and I now believe we've misunderstood the early centuries of this country's history. Instead of a nation crushed and then created by invaders, I found a strong society with a unique and lasting culture. The Roman colonization is supposed to have erased the ancient Britons and instigated a troubled period dominated by invasions from superior civilizations. A period whose only hero was a mythical one, the legendary King Arthur valiantly fighting the invading hordes. But I don't believe our ancient culture was overwhelmed as easily as that. I'm determined to examine what really happened in this country after the Romans invaded. I'm going to embark on an archaeological journey to uncover hard evidence for the story of Britain in the first centuries of its recorded history. The story of Britain A.D. Using the latest archaeological research, I'm going to tell the real story of Britain from the perspective of the men and women who lived on this island during this period. And I'm going to start with the first chapter of Britain AD, the Roman occupation of Britain. This peaceful corner of Somerset is the site of one of Britain's earliest and bloodiest battles and is evidence for the crushing of our ancestors in the early years of Britain AD. For hundreds of years before the Roman conquest, this dramatic hill fort was a religious centre for the ancient Britons. When the Roman conquerors arrived, the people up here were ready for them. The banks on the side of the hill are the remains of ramparts that would have stood five metres high. But the hill fort was not designed to face the disciplined might of the Roman army. The defenders were driven back and the gates set alight. The Roman troops stormed through the burning gateway and slaughtered the Britons. Men, women and children were cut down and their bodies left to rot where they fell. After this massacre, the Roman troops destroyed fields and farmland, a clear message to the Britons not to mess with the might of Rome. The events at Cadbury Castle tell a familiar story of the native Britons as tragic victims. It's a story that fits well into the conventional narrative of Britain AD. I'm going to show that this version of our past is wrong. The first few centuries of Britain AD saw the forging of our national identity. Archaeology is beginning to show that far from the Dark Age, this was a time of huge creativity and development. Until now, the legacy of Roman Britain has blocked our understanding of this period. In order to appreciate the significance of these times, we must go back to the archaeology. The archaeologists who excavated here at Cadbury Castle didn't only find evidence of a Roman massacre. 
They also came across building foundations that dated to soon after the Roman occupation. This confirmed what I had thought, that ancient British culture was strong. But there's a final twist. The archaeologists had been looking for Arthur's Camelot. The locals actually believed that this was Camelot. They'd been ploughing this field. They were coming up with all sorts of materials, most of it Iron Age with a bit of Roman stuff coming up, but they thought it was the site of a battle, really. Yeah. And then relatively small-scale excavation comes across massive refurbishment of the, of the fortifications in roughly the right period, comes across a, a timber-framed hall in the middle with loads and loads of, of Mediterranean-type pottery scattered about. The fact that there is already a connection with Arthur's name means that the, the whole thing is ready to roll. Could Arthur be a clue to what happened in Britain AD? The problem is that Arthurian archaeology is more than a little short of evidence. There isn't a corner of Britain that doesn't claim a connection with this historical celebrity. And this is where Arthur's supposed to have been conceived. And this is Arthur's footprint. This is Bassini Mound. King Arthur's Round Table is buried here. And every year, on Midsummer's Day, it levitates. And this is Arthur's Camelot. This is Slaughter Bridge, where Arthur finally kicked the bucket before being carted off to Avalon. As an archaeologist, I've always been rather sceptical of the Arthurian industry. Arthur is the ultimate commodity. A ready-made hero who's been hijacked by history. And in this dramatic visitor attraction high in the Shropshire countryside, there's a complete Arthurian package. There's a deep lake with a legend of a sword Excalibur, and I'm standing in Arthur's Grotto, where someone claims they found the Holy Grail. There was even a stone with a sword in it, until somebody nicked the sword. Arthur encapsulates so many good qualities that we really want to identify with. Arthur's the great warrior figure, and he'll come back to save us um, when the nation in it is in its greatest peril. And that sort of story has an enormous attraction. This gripping tale of Dark Age Britain has fired the imagination of writers and artists for centuries and it would be easy to dismiss it as a fairy tale with no grounding in historical reality. But myths are not necessarily lies. Stripped of his medieval embellishments, Arthur has new things to tell us about this period. The idea of noble Arthur conflicts with the conventional view of the barbaric Dark Ages and supports my view that British culture survived the Romans intact. And at the heart of Arthur's story, I found a clue to the resilience of the native Britons in the aftermath of Roman rule. The myth of the sword Excalibur holds a clue to what really happened in Britain AD. The story of King Arthur is not a happy one. The tale involves an illegitimate boy who is raised by a magician called Merlin. The boy becomes king and assembles a loyal following of 12 men known as the Knights of the Round Table. King Arthur and his knights fight many gallant battles, but eventually Arthur is killed. His body is taken to the magical island of Avalon, where legend has it Arthur is not dead but sleeping, waiting for a time when his kingdom will need him again. Throughout the many different versions of this story, 
there is a potent image that comes back again and again. Swords play a central role in the Arthurian legends. He learns that he is to be king of Britain when he miraculously withdraws a sword from a stone. At the end of his life, his magical sword Excalibur is returned to a goddess in a lake. As a prehistorian, these stories sent a shiver of recognition down my spine. The image of Arthur pulling his sword out of the stone was an eerie reminder of the ancient practice of casting bronze. I have witnessed this process. The orange glowing sword is actually pulled from a stone mold. In my work as a prehistorian, I had discovered ritual traditions in which weapons were disposed of in watery places and where islands had particular potency. How did these ancient British traditions find their way into the story of King Arthur, written centuries later? The answer lies just north of the Fens in a region known as the Witham Valley. In 1981, archaeologists digging here came across a remarkable discovery. Just under the surface of the fen, a series of upright posts and horizontal timbers were uncovered. They formed part of a raised causeway constructed over 2,000 years ago. At either side of this causeway, archaeologists found dozens of pieces of ancient weaponry, including a large number of swords and spears. And this was not the first time that such objects had been found here. In the late 18th century, when they were dredging the Witham, Sir Joseph Banks, a great scientist and collector, mm -hmm. put out a, a notice to the workmen to say, uh, anybody finds anything, you come to me, I'll see you all right. And, and it was a wonderful thing to do because this stuff wouldn't have found its way into the museums if that hadn't happened. Over the years, literally hundreds of swords, daggers and other precious items have been dredged from the fens here. They range in date from the prehistoric period right through to the 14th century. Now this wasn't some localized Fenland cult, but part of a much larger belief system. They're still being found today. We've been out here every weekend more or less since August and look at how many people have turned up. They've walked a lot of their parish yeah. already. Um, they've found some fantastic sites over there, of course, just yeah. through field walking. If yeah. they hadn't done it, we'd never know about them. Although individually you might not have thought that you're finding very much, but put all together we found nearly 2,000 separate objects now. And that's an Iron Age axe, part of a shaft it's still there. Again, so rarely see them. <laughs> One eight five eight. That's a Viking axe and a made for splitting heads. This extraordinary, complete Iron Age spear shaft. It's the longest in Europe. Medieval iron swords. A masterpiece. The Witham shield's not really useful as a shield. As with much of this, it's a ritual piece. Although we find weapons, we're finding tools as well. The great and the good and the everyday people, I yeah. think, coming together in this activity. It wasn't until recently that archaeologists began to notice a pattern in the location of these objects. Throughout the valley, there are these slightly higher sandbanks and ridges. These were the remains of ancient causeways, which once formed part of this extraordinary landscape. The Witham Valley stretches in a long, thin line up to the city of Lincoln. Until these fens were drained in the 1780s, 
The Witham would have sprawled all over the low-lying land, weaving a network of islands and marshes. Local people moved around the fens on a series of wooden causeways. The weapons were always discovered near these causeways. At first it was assumed they were accidentally dropped or lost in battle. In fact, there is a far more mysterious explanation. People were visiting the river, using the river, and for whatever reason, they were leaving this sort of material. The spear could have been used in the river, uh, but it, it seems to have been given to the river. And I like the idea of them being given and returned to the waters, mm. perhaps. Mm. And these medieval iron swords, well, the sword theme does mm. actually go all the way through, through millennia. For hundreds of years, weapons have been deliberately thrown from these causeways into the water. I believe that the story of King Arthur receiving his sword Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake is a direct reference to this ancient British tradition. But the Arthurian legends were written much later, long after these ancient religious ideas were supposedly wiped out by the Romans and Christianity. How on earth did they survive? The Witham had one more secret to reveal. This area of Fenland has one of the highest concentrations of monastic sites anywhere in Britain. There can be no practical need for so many abbeys in such a small area. So why was the early medieval church building here with such extraordinary fervour? The narrow 10-mile stretch of the Witham Valley is scattered with the remains of 14 abbeys. Every one of these abbeys is built at the end of an ancient causeway. We found it really difficult to understand why there should be 14 church sites all lined up for 10 miles yeah. along the edge of the Witham Valley. Historians Dave Stocker and Paul Everson don't think that this is a coincidence. The abbey we are standing on is on an island. You find there's only one way to get here, and it's along a causeway. It seems odd that a causeway should determine where you're going to put an, an abbey. You have to bear in mind that to cross any sort of body of water, but particularly to cross a fen by yeah. boat, was a dangerous matter. And uh, in, in order to, uh, to, to make it a successful crossing, you had to offer some sort of um, piety. Uh, yeah. Some sort of, uh, call it superstition, but, it, but it, was, it was a sort of folk superstition which was bound up with religion. The weapons and the water into which they were being placed had significance for the people of ancient Britain. Swords weren't just a weapon. The sword is a great symbol of authority, which is distributed outwards from lords to their tenants as a badge of office. Once the tenant dies, that sword has to go back to the Lord, and that's attested in many Anglo-Saxon wills. Now, imagine that you're a king, and you haven't got a Lord, or at least not on Earth, and in the Arthur story, of course, it's the Spirit of the Lake, it's the Lady of the Lake, who is the guardian of Britain. The story of the Lady in the Lake echoes the ancient tradition of depositing weapons in water. The medieval authors who wrote these tales knew about such traditions because Christianity had not killed them off, but had kept them alive. When were the last swords going in? Well, the latest one is 14th century. And interestingly enough, that's precisely the same moment at yeah. which uh, swords and indeed whole body armour yeah. tend to start being hung up in churches over burials uh, of, of lords. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds to me uh, looking at it as a prehistorian, but actually what some of these chaps in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the abbeys are doing sounds awfully sort of pagan to me. Pope Gregory has said, I don't want you knocking down these pagan temples, yeah. I want you converting the pagan idols. Water is the one connecting thread. 
the Bronze Age uh, barrows were by the water. Yeah. The causeways cross the water. The swords are put into the water. So the one connecting thread of all this is water. And do you suppose that might be a reason why that fantastic cathedral over there is placed right by the River Witham? I have very little doubt that that's the case. The first name for Lincoln is Indo Colne, city by the pool. Nikor is what the Normans tended to call the place. And the word Nikor means water spirit. The story of the Witham is one of continuity. It suggests that deep-rooted ideas that began in prehistory continued well into the medieval period. This clashes with what I learnt at school, where the first 1,000 years of British history were a series of massive invasions. Indeed, the first of these, the Roman invasion, may not have been a forced invasion at all. At the heart of a tale about a boy and a magical sword, I found evidence that ancient British traditions survived the Roman invasion. A new series of archaeological discoveries are beginning to rewrite the story of the Roman invasion of Britain. This elegant mosaic decorated the floor of one of the most luxurious buildings in Roman Britain. But this was not the overseas residence of some extravagant Roman governor but the home of a wealthy, Romanized Brit. Fishbourne Palace is the largest building ever excavated in Roman Britain. Martin Hennig helped excavate the gardens. It was absolutely amazing. Digging along, your trowel couldn't help sinking in, and you were actually uncovering the bedding trenches, probably for box. You can see Similar gardens on a much smaller scale if you go to Pompeii. On a smaller scale? Yes. What you've got here is something that's equivalent to the palaces of the greatest Roman aristocrats. Fishbourne covers a larger area than Buckingham Palace. 160 stone columns support the roof, which is constructed from 100 tons of imported Italian tiles. Corridors surround over 100 rooms, some of which are decorated with elaborate mosaics. When Fishbourne was discovered, it was assumed that this was a palace of a Roman governor, a symbol of the imperial regime that had been forced on Britain. But during excavations, archaeologists came across a gold signet ring with an unusual inscription, the seal of Tiberius Claudius Catuarius. The ring belonged to a wealthy Briton. But what was it doing at Fishbourne? To understand why a Briton might be living in a Roman palace, we must look again at the events leading up to the invasion of AD 43. Maybe because we haven't been invaded since 1066, we British have a simplistic attitude towards invasions. We see them as being inevitably oppressive. So we imagine that when the Romans arrived, they wiped out British culture and customs. But in actual fact, it wasn't a straightforward process of colonization. Archaeologists are starting to radically rethink the Roman invasion of Britain. I would imagine the Britons faced by the might of Rome would have been quaking in their boots. I don't think it was quite that. The previous attempt to uh, invade Britain was that of the bad and mad Emperor Caligula, who had marched a large army up to the Channel Coast. He then put all his catapults in a row and they fired enormous rocks into the sea. After a time, he told them that he had won a great victory over Neptune. You can imagine how that got about. The great Roman Empire was run by a lot of Charlies, and uh, <laughs> it completely destabilized the, the situation, of course. 
Roman Britain was in fact a collection of often feuding tribal kingdoms. There is very little written evidence about early British tribes, but John Crichton showed me a burial from the period which contained some intriguing items. Lexton Tumulus is a burial found just outside Colchester. Dates to about 10 BC, so this is still about 50, 60 years before the Roman conquest. Containers of Roman wine, small little Cupid, bronze work coming in from the Italian world. This stuff just isn't being produced in Britain at all. Here's a small little medallion of the Roman emperor, the Emperor Augustus. So a really nice personal gift from the emperor. But why would an Iron Age king in Britain want to have a Roman emperor's head in his grave? <laughs> They're associating themselves with Rome. It's like all the satellite states around the Soviet Union or the influence America had in, in, in Central America. Um, big, powerful empires have very, very close relations with all the states around them. Certain tribal leaders in Britain had been friendly with Rome for decades before the invasion. Their coins reflect the glory of the empire. Coinage is never politically neutral. It's always saying something, it's always meaning something. It has its own native style to start with. Um, but then, around about the time of this kind of burial, we start finding classical imagery appearing on the coins. So they would have been familiar with classical literature? Certainly the upstairs, yes. And that can't be a coincidence. The kings in Britain are very tightly bound in with the power politics in Rome. We see them adopting the same imagery, um, again showing their affiliation to the New World Order. There was one British king known as Verica, who was on particularly good terms with Rome. His tribe was the Atrobates. In the most complete version of the Roman invasion, the historian Cassius Dio describes Verica inviting the Roman troops in. A certain Verica had persuaded the Emperor Claudius to send a force to Britain, led by the distinguished Senator Plautius. This wasn't a subservient relationship. Verica would help the Romans if he was uh, able to do so, and that they would help him if need be. In AD 43, the need did arise when Verica's kingdom was invaded. The Atrobates had been effectively under military occupation by tribes from the north. That rather implies that, to people down here at least, the Romans weren't that unwelcome. The Romans arrived as, as liberators. This is a revolutionary idea, but can it be supported by archaeology? Cassius Dio on the invasion. On the way across, they were first discouraged but they recovered when they saw a flash of light cross the sky from east to west, the direction they were travelling. When the fleet reached the island, there was no one to oppose them. Dio, however, omits to mention where the invasion took place. Why was I taught as a student? that the Romans landed in large numbers on the Kentish shore at Richborough. There had been excavations at Richborough which dis certainly discovered some early military evidence. They looked at the third century account and added topographical details so that a battle on the Medway uh, became almost a historical fact, though actually the, the, the river Medway is nowhere mentioned. So, so archaeologists invented it? Yes, it's a total invention. If the Romans didn't arrive at Richborough, where did they land? There is another possible site for the Roman invasion. Chichester Harbour, slap bang in the middle of Verica's territory. This is a fairly typical tidal creek. What makes it special? It's nice and sheltered, a wonderful natural harbour, which would have allowed large numbers of men to be disembarked. Yes. If you had a Roman invasion arriving here, what sort of number of boats? Um, perhaps uh, two or three hundred. Yeah. Uh, so a large number of boats that would need to be manoeuvred.
Chichester Harbour is in fact right next to Fishbourne Palace. So was the palace anything to do with King Verica? The palace was built 30 years after the invasion. However, recent finds of ceramics have revealed that there was a base at Fishbourne before the invasion. John Manley was involved in the excavations. The fact that we found these kind of ceramics and food remains suggests it was a heavily Romanized place before AD 43. To my mind, it makes it much more likely that a large part of the invasion force landed here in territory that they were familiar with, maybe in territory where they already had client kings. It was Verica who pleaded with the Romans to come to Britain. And Verica lived somewhere around here, Chichester Fishbourne area, and that that was used as a pretext for the invasion of Britain. Now, we don't hear of Verica again after AD 41, so it is conceivable his relative, maybe even his son, was brought in by the incoming Romans and settled here as a client king. Although we can't be certain, Verica's son was probably called Toggy Dubnus. Excavations at Fishbourne found the marble bust of a child. Was this the owner of the palace? The marble head has to have been carved in Rome. There was no marble carving in Britain. It's very likely that of Togadabinus, at the time, he was made a Roman citizen. Do you think Togadabinus himself would have lived here at Fishbourne? I think almost undoubtedly he did. It's an enormous palace. This must have been something of a power center for uh, King Togadabinus, who was increasingly given territories and authority to rule much of the rest of the province. This contradicts the conventional account of the Roman conquest. King Verica opened his doors to the Roman troops who sailed peacefully up Chichester Harbour. In honour of this new alliance, the most splendid palace was built not as a symbol of Roman suppression, but as a celebration of British tribal power. The Romans claimed that they came, saw and conquered, but in actual fact they were invited into this country. Once here, they didn't crush our native culture, but guided the development of an increasingly diverse society. In the years after the invasion, the Romans built a series of towns across Britain. Perhaps most opulent of these was Bath. The buildings here typify the elegance and the glory of the Roman Empire. The town was built on the site of an ancient spring, which had been a religious site for thousands of years. It's a great natural phenomenon. A quarter of a million gallons of water a day just pours out of the ground. It's hot, it's 40-odd degrees centigrade. Barry Cundiff excavated the baths in the 1970s. Within 30 years of the invasion, they were putting up this great monument. And the first job was to contain the spring. It was a pretty impressive piece of engineering because of that water coming out all the time. You could take one view. Here are the Romans who've come to this place and they've imposed this great Roman building, um, slapped it down on the landscape. Uh, and this could be seen as a, a sort of imperialism. But it, I don't think it's like that at all. What we're seeing here is the Romans being very, very sensitive to the sanctity of the place. They recognize it as a sacred place. Uh, they appreciate it as a sacred place. Although the buildings are Roman and the sculptures look Roman, the iconography, I think, is hinting at something that goes right back into the Iron Age. When we excavated in the temple precinct, we were able to work out there was a, a real order about it. Facing east with the great Gorgon's head was the temple front itself. And then on either side, there were two sculptured facades with pediments. Uh, on the north side, the pediment had the goddess Luna in it, uh, who was um, shown riding her chariot across the night sky. On the southern side was a pediment with a god of the sun, Sol, with a um, spiky crown. 
So you've got a sort of sense of north, cold, south, hot. And the south side presiding over the hot spring. And the balance between um, the goddess and the god, the male-female. This encapsulates a much earlier belief. So the Romans are, if you like, taking over the sacred geography of the place uh, and are monumentalizing that. Many objects were thrown into the sacred spring as offerings. This is a startling reminder of the age-old customs in the Witham Valley and the Arthurian story of the Lady of the Lake. The spring is a fissure going down into the underworld where the deities live, so you could communicate there. This, we know from the Roman period, was sacred to Sulis Minerva, the two words put together. Now, Minerva, of course, is the Roman goddess. And Sulis is presumably the Iron Age goddess, the person revered here going right back in time. The earliest occupation that is Mesolithic, going back to 7000 BC. People will always have revered it. You can imagine what it would have looked like at the time of the Roman conquest. The water brings up iron oxide and that would have spread red crusts around on this black mud. And it must have looked almost as though the ground was bleeding. The construction of these baths is a magnificent feat of engineering for which the Romans are quite rightly admired. Although they gave us magnificent buildings and luxurious baths, I do not believe that the Romans fundamentally changed this country's soul. Through the years of Roman occupation, Britain developed a unique ability to absorb foreign influences without losing its own identity. But the biggest foreign influence had yet to arrive. It originated not in Rome, but in the Holy Lands of Jerusalem, and it would contribute to the fall of the empire in Britain. It's long been assumed, but having forced themselves on Britain, the Romans abandoned this insignificant island to deal with more pressing problems at home. However, I don't believe this was the case. This vast lead tank has been restored to its original state. But when I first saw it, I was crammed at the bottom of a Roman well and the tank lay there like a crumpled milk carton. I remember thinking, why on earth didn't they melt it down and reuse this valuable lead? Why dispose of it in this deliberate fashion? What was so special about this tank? The tank is decorated with a symbol which combines the Greek letters Chi and Rho, which is a sign of very early Christian worship. This is Constantine the Great. Near this spot in July 306, he was made Emperor of Rome. He later went on to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. It was a time of immense political change that foreshadowed the ultimate collapse of the Roman Empire in the West. By encouraging Christianity in Britain, Constantine gave his subjects something that would become more powerful than Rome itself. Constantine's conversion came towards the end of the Roman occupation of Britain by which time the structure of society had begun to change. During the late 3rd century and on into the 4th, the super-rich stop spending their money on public buildings for the benefit of the population in general. They spend it on themselves. The big money moves out of the towns. It's a pattern we've seen in our own time. Wealthy people tend to take their money out to their country estates. The great villas were just scattered throughout southern Britain. There we have these people, right out on the fringe of the Roman world, aping a classical world from hundreds of years ago. 
These people were sticking references to classical mythology, and classical literature, on the floors in their houses. These mosaics hold a key to the way in which beliefs in Britain changed. Chedworth Villa in Gloucestershire was one of the richest of these country houses. Phil Bethel showed me around. This was one of probably the top ten richest, most opulent houses in the whole of Britain in the fourth century. All along the length of this corridor, there would have been a continuous mosaic floor, nearly 80 metres long. So they had everything that money at that time could buy. Mosaics in every room, underfloor heating systems, two bathhouses, their very own in-house water shrine. This whole thing was designed to show you I'm rich and I'm powerful. So this was actually a little temple, and here it was actually part of their daily religion where they'd worship in time-honored fashion, going back to the Celtic origins of the Romano-British religion, but they'd worship the spirit of the spring. They seem to have almost recreated a bit of their earlier cultural history. The idea that this was a Roman from Rome living here seems a bit unlikely. The Roman Empire, it was a bit like a sort of a franchise. <laughs> you know, you sort of, the branch of Rome out here in Britain. And the people who actually did the day-to-day -day governing and running of the country, by and large, natives. It would, in this case, would have been native Britons. But from the families that were probably already important before the Romans came, it seems in Gloucestershire there wasn't a big conquest here. The local tribe, the Dubuni, seemed to play along with the Romans when they invaded. And that may be why it became a very wealthy area. Rich, powerful people who lived here already took advantage of that new system to increase their wealth. Some of the mosaics that covered the floor of Chedworth Villa have been destroyed. But many British mosaics have been preserved in architectural drawings. From a society who didn't leave many written records, these mosaics are a unique insight into the complex minds of the Romano Brits and the beliefs that changed their world. Some of these mosaics contain a strange mixture of Christian and pagan symbols, which have long been dismissed as clumsy mistakes. But in actual fact, these images are connected to the mystery of a lead tank. I think that we ought to look at mosaic pavements in much the same way one would look at stained glass windows in, in churches. When you go to Chartres and look at the glorious stained glass windows in a Gothic church, each image up there says something. We have to see this as being a, a literate society, a learned society, elite members of society with a, quite a lot of time on their hands who were interested in reading the classics and the literature and they are trying to make sense of the world they live in. At Lullingston Roman Villa, the discovery of a converted chapel was evidence that Christianity had been practiced here. Within the mosaics, Dominic Perring has found a sign that the people here were dealing in a very unusual Christian cult called Gnosticism. The fourth century is a period of vigorous intellectual ferment. And whereas today we have a strong idea about science uh, as leading us forward, then it was very clearly philosophy. People were trying to escape the mortal condition, this prison of, of our world. To escape, it was about knowing the secrets. It was about knowing how to move into a higher plane of existence. And knowledge was very much part of that. Knowledge of the images, knowledge of mythology, knowledge of philosophy, uh, knowledge of Christ, um, but also uh, secret knowledges. Hidden in the mosaics, Dominic has found Gnostic images which blend classical myths with the Christian ideas about immortality. This strange fusion of beliefs was at the heart of a Gnostic cult. It may have become a symbol of Romano-British culture. Bellerophon is slaying a monster. 
He's riding winged Pegasus. The message here is both good slaying evil, but also the attempt to reach life immortal. It certainly was a set of beliefs which lent itself to urban aristocratic elite society and villa society. These were people who were able to engage in these arcane discussions, these philosophical debates. Such independent thinking could not be tolerated by the Empire, and in 380, the Emperor denounced Gnosticism as heresy. The Emperor establishes edicts against heresies, and you're allowed to exile people, confiscate the lands and whatever. How does one stop heretics being heretics? Well, stop them baptizing. If a bishop can't baptize a flock, you don't increase the size of the flock. So destruction of, of, of baptismal fonts is one way of doing it. We've got archaeological evidence of damaged lead tanks, some of which quite clearly were used for baptism, which are being cut into pieces and thrown down wells. The crumpled baptism tank that I had seen was just one of many Christian items which had been deliberately destroyed or buried in this area. We have church plate, baptismal spoons, the chalice used in the Eucharist, being buried in some of these silver hoards. People are decommissioning these items. Whoever buried this collection of precious silver must have felt anger and resentment because their property, their beliefs, their very identity were under attack. By the time this treasure was buried, Rome had lost the hearts and minds of the native Britons. Having invited the Romans in, absorbed and digested the rich and various influences of a classical world, Britain turned its back on Rome and looked to an independent future. The end of Roman administration was a new beginning for the people of Britain. Three and a half centuries after the Romans destroyed it, the magnificent hill fort of South Cadbury was reoccupied. It has long been imagined that the figure who led this resurgence was King Arthur. Arthur is a kind of product of different generations and how they see themselves. Um, Arthur was created largely by medieval romantic historians who wanted to create a kind of pseudo-chronology of events after the Roman invasion. And the trouble is it's loosely threaded together with pieces of genuine evidence. And it depends on how literally you choose to take bits of that. I rather suspect that Arthur is a kind of metaphor, a symbol, for the sort of petty tribal chieftain who would have taken over power in a region after the Roman power collapsed in Britain. A man who could hold his people together. This valiant king embodies a brave new world in which the descendants of Roman Britain began to build an independent future. And yet for centuries, we have shrouded this exciting time under a veil of mystery and labelled it the Dark Ages. <laughs>